To all the students in the room, and to those of you who remember your student days fondly, what if I told you that with one week of data collected from your smartphone, I could predict your end of term grade point average 10 weeks into the future with 95% accuracy? Pretty cool, right? Something you could get excited about? <laughs> but to do that, I need your smartphone and I need one week of your data. Now, we're living in a world where the promise of computed embedded everywhere and in everything is coming true. We're surrounded by smart devices, smart watches, smart phones, smart vacuum cleaners, with millions more of these devices being sold every day. These devices constantly and passively are collecting data about us, and we're not even aware of it. Most of the time, though, they throw that data away as being transient and irrelevant. Let me give you an example. Do you know what an accelerometer is? An accelerometer is a tiny little sensor that is embedded in almost every smart device. In a smartphone, it collects information about how a phone is being held, and it can collect information about how you're moving through space, whether you're in a car or walking through a space. And it's collecting all of that data and almost immediately throwing it away because it's not very useful. And that's true for most of the sensors on a smartphone. But what if it didn't throw all of that data away? Imagine a world where everything you interacted with could collect data about those interactions and then share it with other people. OK, I know that sounds a little bit creepy. Probably sounds a lot creepy. But suspend your concern for just a minute. And let me tell you about some of the benefits of such a world. This data from all of these smart devices can be used to create a behavioral image, a visual image of your behaviors and patterns over time. So very similar to how a medical x-ray can detect what's going on inside of our body, a behavioral x-ray can tell us about our behaviors and patterns. Using machine learning and all of the data from these smart devices that are all around us, we can produce a really personalized and unique behavioral x-ray for every single one of you. And just like a medical expert can use this medical x-ray to diagnose that you have a fracture, a machine learning expert can use a behavioral x-ray to do some really cool things too. To predict your end of term GPA, to predict that someone's going to binge drink in the next hour, or to predict that someone's going to be depressed at the end of an academic term. We can use these behavioral images from all of the smart devices around us to understand, to describe, to detect, and predict issues of mental health. Now I focus on mental health. The National Institute of Mental Health before the pandemic found that 21% of all adults suffered from some form of mental health issues. College students were hit the hardest, 18 to 25 years old, at 30%. Now it manifests itself in college students through their grades, depression, anxiety, substance abuse, and even suicidality. During the pandemic, this got much worse though. One study in 2020 found that 83% of students felt that their mental health issues were negatively impacting their grade point average. 67% thought that they were being isolated and felt lonely. And 50% were positively screened for depression and anxiety. Mental health disorders are a national, if not a global, health crisis. So we have all of these devices that can collect information about us. We can use the data to, form these, to create these behavioral x-rays. And we can use these to understand issues of mental health. And one day, we hope to use these the behavioral images to be able to reduce the symptoms of mental health and perhaps even avoid them starting altogether. But it comes down to understanding how you use your mobile devices, how you use your smart devices. So have you thought about all the interactions that you have with your smart devices? Even a fleeting interaction, something as simple that you do hundreds of times a day, unlocking your phone, how that information can actually be used to produce a window into who you are and what your future might hold. We can use these behavioral images to actually understand and address the global health crisis that exists due to mental health. I want you to think about how you can leverage this kind of data to actually impact your future. But right now, I want to go a little bit into the past. I've been in higher education for almost 30 years. And in my time in those 30 years, I've witnessed firsthand the impact of mental health issues on college students. And I was really inspired by some work from Dartmouth College that demonstrated first that you could take this data from smartphones and use it to understand the human experience. And what's really exciting to me is that we can now leverage the smart devices to collect data on hundreds and hundreds of students. So you can see some of my students in the background who are my research team from the University of Washington and Carnegie Mellon University who have helped us collect data for seven years on hundreds of students to better understand their grades, the impact of discrimination on their lives, and issues of anxiety and depression. 
And with other colleagues, we've been looking at issues of substance abuse, heavy marijuana use, and binge drinking. And because there's a nice correlation, maybe not so nice, but a correlation between substance abuse and mental health issues. So we want to be able to understand it all. And from a technical perspective, one of the most exciting things is that we can leverage the same technology. These same smart devices that you all carry around, collecting that data that's just thrown away, we can create these behavioral images that can attract all of these problems. But what is in all of these devices that allows us to do this? All of these devices, whether it's a smart speaker, smartphone, or smartwatch, they all have sensing technology. They all have the ability to have, uh, in, compute and have intelligence and be able to infer what's going on and make a decision about what to do next. And they all have communication ability. They can communicate the results out to the rest of the world. They all have a piece of software called an operating system that controls what sensors are enabled on these devices and what to do with that, those, that sensor data. Most of the time, they throw it away. We've built an open source platform that we can apply to most smart devices in the world. And that can, where we get to control what devices, what sensors we collect data from, and how we use that data, mostly to beha build behavioral images. This is the inside of an iPhone. These are all the sensors that you can collect data from on an iPhone. If it's on this list, we can collect data about you and how you interact with the world. In addition to the sensor data, though, we also need to understand what, is stu what are students' uh, situations with mental health. So we survey them, sometimes monthly, sometimes weekly, sometimes even hourly, to understand their grades, their demographics, how they're feeling, their sense of anxiety, and yes, whether they're using illegal or legal substances at this very moment. And we ha use this data, so now we have sensor data and we have survey data, and we use this data together to, in order to build our behavioral images. And we do this in two different ways. The first is, taking a very scientific approach, where we scour the scientific literature to try and understand what other scientists have already found that link behavioral patterns to issues of mental health. So sleep quality is a great example for college students. Poor sleep quality of college students is going to impact their grades. More, they're more likely to abuse substances, and they're more likely to be depressed. We pair this scientific approach with a really exploratory approach, or we call it the kitchen sink approach, where we just compute thousands and thousands of statistics, ones that we're not even sure are going to work, in order to see what patterns are there that we, we didn't know existed before. We take both of these approaches together, and we build our behavioral x-rays that I showed you earlier. And we can use these behavioral x-rays to de describe, detect, and predict what's going on in terms of mental health. Now, I'm showing you an image of a self-driving car, because the visuals of a self-driving car are a little bit easier to understand. But let's walk through each one of these. On the description side, in mental health, we can use statistics from your smart devices to describe why this population of students is suffering from mental health, but this group over here is not. In the case of a self-driving car, it's using statistics from the sensors to detect what's in the image, a pedestrian, a, a parked car, or a bicyclist. The next step is detection. In the mental health, we are trying to detect current state. A student is currently suffering from mental health. A student is currently uh, abusing a substance. In the case of a self-driving car, it's being able to detect that this bicyclist is actually in the car's path and that the car shouldn't move forward. The last step is prediction. In mental health, we're trying to predict a future state. We want to know if a college student's going to binge drink later today or a student's going to have mental health issues in three months. In the case of a self-driving car, we're predicting the likelihood that this pedestrian is going to veer out in front of the self-driving car so that the self-driving car can take immediate action. Let's talk now really specifically about what we can do with these behavioral images in the context of mental health. So what I'm showing here on the screen is a timeline of 11 weeks, 10 weeks of classes and one week of final exams. And the goal is to predict whether a student's going to be experiencing depressive symptoms or not at the end of that academic quarter. We found that we can build a behavioral x-ray with four weeks of your data from your smartphone and a wearable fitness tracker. And with that data, we can predict whether you're going to experience depressive symptoms or not seven weeks in advance with 81% accuracy. And the kind of data that we use to extract from this behavioral image is kind of interesting. It's how much time are you spending in different locations. So the more time you spend in a small number of locations, which means you're not out interacting with the world, that increases the likelihood that you're going to be depressed. Maybe not surprising. The number of people you interact with is sensed by your GPS, your accelerometer, and the applications on your phone. The fewer people you interact with, again, more likely a chance you're going to be depressed. Now, those findings may not be new or surprising to you, but the fact that you can do it with four weeks of data from your mobile phone 
hopefully it. Let's look at our second case study, and that is predicting student performance. The average GPA at the University of Washington is 3.2. So our goal here is to predict in advance, is the student going to get higher or lower than that 3.2 average? And I've already told you, I've already told you the punchline at the very beginning. With one week of data from your smartphone and a wearable fitness tracker, we can predict 10 weeks in advance. So just data from that first week of classes, we can predict whether you're going to get higher or lower than that 3.2 GPA with 95% accuracy. And the statistics from this behavioral image are really interesting. One of them, not, maybe not surprising, how you spend time on your phone at night. The more time you spend on your phone at night, not studying, the likely, more, higher the likelihood that you're going to have a lower GPA. Not surprising. But your cell phone service provider is actually a really strong indicator of your ending GPA. Students with low cost providers tend to have lower GPAs, which really highlights a potentially a unique interaction between socioeconomic status and GPA that needs to be explored. Our last case that we want to talk about are, is our ability to, to detect and predict that a college student is drinking, binge drinking, drinking to excess. And because this might happen, more than once a quarter, we want to look at a smaller window in which to do this analysis. So what you're seeing on the screen now is a six hour window. So we can create a behavioral image from six hours of data on your phone, and we can use that to detect in real time that you're binge drinking just from your phone, that you're binge drinking with 97% accuracy. There's more. With that same six hour behavioral image, we can predict one hour into the future that you're going to be binge drinking or not with 93% accuracy. Here, very similar to the work in depression, the number of people you interact with is actually remarkably predictive of whether you're going to binge drink. We believe it's because of the social support that you get through those interactions with other people that limit the impact of binge drinking. Now to us, it was pretty mind blowing to see that we could take these behavioral images that are captured from devices that you all carry around that are built off of data that is just collected and thrown away that we could build these behavioral images and have this kind of impact on our understanding of mental health. There are some challenges, though, that we need to address. You'd be far from alone if you were a little bit creeped out, or maybe a lot creeped out, by all the things I can sense from your mobile phone. But let's take it one step further. What if the person standing, sitting next to you had access to all the applications you were using on your phone, who you were talking to, who you were communicating with, and where you were at any given time? Super creepy, right? But that's the kind of power we're giving to these smart devices and these algorithms running behind the scenes. What if you had a system that could predict that you're going to suffer from a mental health issue and it started sending you these messages about how to change your behavior in ways that were not really appropriate? That would be really challenging and really creepy too. So we know we have some challenges to address. First and foremost, there's issues of privacy and also our sense of self-agency, our ability to be in charge of our own destiny. We try to address these problems by shrinking our behavioral image as much as possible, collecting only what's absolutely necessary and trying never to let that data leave the phone. But there's another challenge, and that is now that we can predict that someone may have a mental health issue in the future, what are we going to do about it? And this is the problem of intervention. So how are we going to intervene to try and improve somebody's life in a not creepy way? Again, we're trying to use these behavioral images that we've collected to personalize and customize an intervention that's going to work for you for the issue that you're facing or that the system thinks you're going to be facing in a way that's perfectly tuned to your current situation. Despite the challenges that exist with this kind of technology, the opportunities to do good in the world are huge. We're going to be living in a world that's more and more computationally advanced. Billions of smart devices are being added to the world every single year. And it's not just smartphones, smart watches, smart speakers, smart vacuum cleaner. In my group, we've instrumented pill boxes, coffee machines, telephone lines, in order to detect cognitive decline in an elderly population. We can instrument almost any object you can think of. So imagine a world where everything you touch, interact with, or are just standing next to has the ability to learn information about you and use that information for good or for bad. We have to think about how we want to engage in this world, how we want to live in this world, how we want to control this world so that we get the benefits, so that we avoid misuse and we avoid you know, the fundamentally creepy nature of this technology. It gives us opportunities. It will enable new opportunities like a doctor being able to use behavioral images of her patient to try and understand why this patient is healing and this patient is not. For an economist to look at population-wide spending trends to understand a regional economy better. 
and for a teacher to understand the behavioral images of her students, to try and understand why students are performing better or worse in her class. Despite these opportunities, there are these challenges that we need to address. And we have to be fundamentally intentional about how we're going to use these devices, how we're going to learn from these devices, how we're going to interact with these devices, how we're going to learn about ourselves, and how we're going to learn about other people around us. And we need to do that now. This world that I talked about, it's coming soon. And we need to start preparing for it today. There's promise, though. There's a promise that we no longer need an expert to tell us that we're going to have a behavioral issue in two months or later today, that we can do it for ourselves. There's, and that's the real promise behind this technology, that we can use the devices that all of you carry, using data that's just mostly thrown away, to create a behavioral image that is so accurate it's to a degree we've never known before. Think about that. So think about all the devices that you've interacted with today, the objects, the chairs you're sitting on, the floor you're standing on, and the behavioral image that we could produce from just what happened today. Think about what we can learn about these, from these behavioral images and what you want to learn about these behavioral images. In one minute, we can learn, collect data, and analyze that data that can significantly change your future. Think hard and tell me, how do you want to use your minute? Thank you very much. <laughs>